Hey, everybody. Welcome to Spin is a Four-Letter Word, the Maroon PR podcast, all things marketing and PR, and we're a new episode of Having a Beer With. Today, we're having a beer with our good friend, Bill Ripkin of MLB Network, former Oriole. Bill, thank you so much for being here today. Appreciate Spin it. is a four-letter word. Spin is a four-letter word. And Jen Renahan, our esteemed COO, joining us as always. Hello, Jen. Speaking to the mic. Hello. Thank Spin you. is a four-letter word. Yeah. So, listen, before we get started, thanks. A big shout-out to John Minidakis, Tony Minidakis, and Jimmy's Famous Seafood for hosting us today. Not only hosting us, just giving us these beautiful crabs, always being welcoming and friendly. There's a reason people love Jimmy's Seafood, and it's known all across the country. because they do so many things right. They give back to the community. They're active. They get, make great freaking food, and we're very grateful to them. Hey, can um, I do two member, uh, numbers of housekeeping? One, no yeah. collar. Because True. when you're eating crabs and having beers, you should be in a T-shirt. Sorry about that. Two, about Jimmy's. Yes, we get the seafood. Sleeper pick. I did it last year. Thanksgiving. Uh, right out of this place. Wow. That's right. Think about it. I will think about it because we don't go back to Jersey on Thanksgiving anymore because of the traffic and the dog and whatnot. So Thanksgiving might have to happen. Thank you, Bill Ripkin. <laughs> so listen, as, let's get started by eating these crabs and why do we eat crabs and how do we eat crabs. My first time eating crabs was a month or two of living in Maryland. It was my birthday and we went to a place called the Crack Pot in Towson. I don't even know if it's still there. When we went there, we walked in, and they said, are you here for crabs or dinner? Carolyn and I from Jersey are looking at each other like, well, we want crabs for dinner. The woman said, first time? We said, yeah. <laughs> she said, sit down. She sat with us, and she showed us how to clean and eat a crab. And if she didn't do that, we wouldn't be hooked on these suckers like we have been for the last 30 years. So thanks to that woman who I don't remember <laughs> at, at the crack pot. But Ripper, Jen was saying before we came on that, it does seem everybody has a different technique, even within your family. Correct. I know your brother pulls off legs and whatnot. What's your, what's your technique right. and why? Let's go first and foremost, once you grab the uh, dude to begin with. This is called the apron. So get in there with the knife, get the apron out of there. Once you get the apron off, we're going to go ahead and split them open. Get that shell off of there, get out of here, because I don't want anything to do with it. <laughs> now, these things are the lungs. And this is some mustard and some innards. Some people like the innards and mustard. Um, those people are just nasty. Sorry, mustard, Jen. Mustard, not the innards, nasty. just the mustard. So we're going to scrape this, clean out the, the innards right there, the intestines and all the nasty stuff that Jen likes. <laughs> Lungs gone. Once we get them looking like that, I leave legs on. I like the legs staying on my, my thing. It's very Ripken-esque. We're just going to break this thing in half. Oh. Once we get them like this... We can give them a little bit of a deep tissue massage, if you will. And we get rid of this one piece of shell here, and we should be able to get a decent amount of crab meat out of these Boom. parts right Look there that. once Some you get call in them there. Lollipops. Some call them lollipops. <laughs> Not I. So, Ripper, <laughs> who, uh, who taught you your method? Was it Cal Senior? Was it developed on your own? A little combo of the two? You know, How did this happen? I think over time, they went with, like, Cal's batting stances. Um, <laughs> they had a tendency to change over time. I know I went through one phase where I was pulling legs off at will, but I like leaving them on there and getting to them uh, last now. And I've been doing this one for a while. I'm not sure where the formula came from, but if you eat enough of them, I don't think you can eat the, the exact same way. Sometimes if they feel a little bit lighter than other times, uh, you might want to pull mm. the legs off first because mm -hmm. you seem to be able to get more of the lunch meat out, or lunch meat, out. the crab That's meat right. out to begin with, <laughs> which know, is good for lunch. Does your whole family like them, Candace, all the kids? Are they all crab people? Um, for the most part. Um, I think young Jack is the one that um, probably could do with or without. Um, but, but when they are there and if he sees us picking some of them, he, he'll sit down next to you and maybe steal some of yours. Yeah. It's good. But I think for the people that are outside of this state, they don't want to put in the work That's to right. get it done. Um, they're a little bit lazier when it comes to that, so they might be the ones okay. that go to the grocery store and get jumbo uh, lump in the container. But yeah. it's just not the same. When I mean, you got all the Old Bay and all the seasoning on it and you rub all that in there, it's good. But that kind of goes to the fact if you've never, as a, you know, as a kid... I couldn't join the crab table until I knew how to pick 
my crabs. That was our family rule. Mm. But like it, it's a thing. It's a family thing. You sit around the table yes. for hours, you eat. It's not really about, I mean, they're good and they taste good and they're right. great, but it's about the experience. And if you're not from here and you don't get to do that, coming here and eating at a crab house is like, what? It's it's crab true. Cake. We didn't yeah. grow up with crabs and we've come to love them. Mm-hmm. If you're in Kansas thing. City, you're going to eat the barbecue. That's right. Yeah. And you're going to do that. But if you're here, you better do this. Yes. Yes, and have someone teach you. Not lucky enough always to have 12 year big leaguer, Emmy award winning broadcaster. All the do above. It, but hey, we are. Um, <laughs> Ripper, besides crabs, people in Maryland love the Orioles. The Baltimore Orioles seem to be kind of back, baby. They're hot They're right playing now. good. And they got some young guys that I think are really exciting the city. It's good to see people excited by the team again. What's your take on that club? Well, last year, I thought they did such a good job of surpassing all expectations, I think, from everybody. And I was the first one when the start of the year started. I said, don't be surprised if you hit standstill, status quo, or you take a little bit of step back. Because I've just noticed over the years, once a team does what they did last year, it's hard to necessarily replicate that or duplicate that for, for whatever reason. Um, after a month into the season or after 40 games into the season now, I've kind of come off that stance. Um, they got some guys that are figuring it out. Adley Rushman came up to the big leagues last year. And do yourself a favor out there is if you like looking up numbers, look up the numbers of Adley Rushman. Not Adley Rushman's numbers per se, but the Orioles' numbers since Adley Rushman took the field and, and became a member of the Orioles because they are such – a different team than they were before he came up. He's got leadership qualities. Um, Do I annoy some Yankee fans from time to time? Because I actually dare to say, is there some Derek Jeter in there somewhere Mm. Um, with Adley Rushman? You don't don't necessarily put your finger on it, but something's right when that dude's in the lineup and playing every day. The kid posts. Um, So they've got some guys figuring it out. Jorge Mateo is coming into his own. I think he's starting to figure his game out. Cedric uh, Mullins is bouncing back from his 30-30 year of a couple years ago to the little bit of a rough potch he had last year, and he's playing well. You got some dudes on the bump um, that can bring it. You got guys at the back end of the bullpen that can bring it. So they have all the pieces right there. It's a matter now of them staying, I guess, healthy enough and being able to maintain this through the 162. It's exciting, and then I'll let Jen chime in here. But um, talk a little bit, Bill, Bill. Tell us a little bit about your transition. So we're with Bill Ripken, who everyone remembers Bill as a 12-year big leaguer, longtime Oriole, famous baseball family. But now he's an Emmy Award-winning broadcaster on MLB Network. Bill, the, the, you always kind of had that natural gift to convey your thoughts really effectively, give smart insights to things, be funny. When did you think about making that transition into broadcasting from, from the playing field? Mm, I don't know if I ever thought about it, to tell you the truth. Um, look, Junior always said I had the gift of gab. Um, and then he also would say that I had the ability to take of what Senior had, where you see some play and you can break it down and then you can explain it in some some simple terms. Uh, when the network started, I would say go back three or four years prior to the network starting. Uh, Junior was um, nominated and won whatever, the March of Dimes Man of the Year. And we went up to the Waldorf Hotel in New York City. And I was the one who introduced him as a lunch crowd. Um, I'm not going to lie, I had a few of these. Um, <laughs> get the microphone in front of me at a lunchtime kind of affair. I get to play victim with Junior being the golden boy and everything that, that rolls around with it. Um, three or four years after that, when the network started, there was a man who took was the number one hire by Major League Baseball to start the network. His name was Tony Petiti. Tony Petiti, at the time of that banquet, prior to the network opening, was in attendance that night ah. in the uh, audience. And at the time, I believe he was with CBS Sports uh, doing all the big Final Fours and, and, and events like that. Um, so he's the one who sent word, Bill's got to come up here and I want to hear what he does. Wow. So we started that relationship then, uh, had conversation with him. I think I started out 50 shows in year one. 
um, have been up as much as 115 shows in any given year. And this is the 14th year I've been going up there and doing it. So I, I think I never I've, know who's going to be in the audience. You never know who's going to be in the audience. But uh, I, I was I had some A game uh, that day introducing Junior for the March of Dimes Man of the Year Award. <laughs> He's man of the year. I've never been, but uh, <laughs> it got me a gig at the network for a long time. Well, I remember years ago, before MLB Network, the XM Serious Radio mm -hmm. show yes. that we did it from Rifkin Stadium. To this day, I talk about um, if you're putting cream in your coffee, it has to be camel colored. You would yell that through the halls. <laughs> camel I yelled colors. <laughs> camel um, colors. Yeah, not caramel. Camel. Some people have confused the caramel and camel. I think they're similar colors, but I like camel color. I wanted but, sugar, and I wanted cream, and I wanted camel color. That's my coffee. Um, but to me, like hearing you in that scenario, I know the, the kind of the way the show went is we would find plays for you guys, and you would break them down, and then you'd talk to managers and different people through the league and whatever. And from that moment, I mean, I could tell like that you had that gift of breaking it down. And so I... I knew it. I, I saw it well well before. <laughs> well before Tony Petiti did at <laughs> yes. the March of Dimes thing. Um, Absolutely. You know what? It, it's been it's been fun. Uh, I I you call your spinning is a four letter word. Yeah. And your have a beer with podcast. Yeah. Everything that I've done since playing baseball kind of relates around this type of behavior anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, if we were up in the minor league stadium, we got a group of people that are sitting out there for the Iron Birds. What is there, 20, 25 people around on, during game days? And it's not dissimilar to the 25 persons that were in your locker room when you played. Right. Up at the network, at any given time, with the various shows going on over the course of the day, there's 25 to 30 people I got to deal with. Mm -hmm. And at all different levels that you deal with. You deal with research, you deal with edit, you deal with the producer, you deal with the coordinating producer, you deal with the makeup artist. Um, but it's all dealing with people. And I, I think that part of me playing baseball and growing up in a baseball world, that environment hasn't changed for me. Right. Now I just don't have to go out there and face you know Nolan Ryan, <laughs> which is a heck of a lot easier while you're, you're sitting here doing this. <laughs> So, Bill, it's interesting to me, like, having known you a long time, I think you've always been true to yourself. And, you know, we always try to talk to people about being their true self and playing to their strengths. What was the hardest adjustment for you, kind of going in front of the camera? And, like, it seems like it happened very naturally, but I'm sure there were certain struggles and things that you had to adapt to. Well, let's, let's spin it this way first. Um, the spin is a four-letter four letter word. word. It's a four-letter word. Um, true to yourself. Now, Senior never said to be true to yourself, but Senior said worry about yourself. Senior said take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. And what he meant by that was understand who you were. Don't worry about what that person's doing. Don't worry about what that person's doing. Do what you can because most of the time it's going to be good enough. Now, in a baseball setting, I think it's pretty easy. Um, unless you're right now, in the game, because I've been using Mike Trout for the last eight years. Right. <laughs> Unless you're Mike Trout, you're not going to find anybody better in the game. Um, so you, you, you can look all around all you want. Unless you're Shohei Otani in today's game, you're going to find somebody that's better than you. You know, so bigger, stronger, faster, right. all the above. Uh, smarter. But if you worry about yourself and you take care of yourself – you'll find that that's going to be good enough most of the time. And Senior didn't lie to me. Um, I think his influence in that way took me as a 17-year-old kid when I graduated high school and went away, that kind of words of wisdom helped me get to the big leagues. I think Senior, with that same mentality, talking to Junior, who was at a better starting point than I ever could have been, Senior's influence on him helps – sculpt and mold him into the Hall of Famer and the Iron Man and everything that we see. So it's, it's, the, it's the same words, worry about yourself, take care of yourself. But if you have different starting points, you know, your, your job as a coach or your job as a parent or your job as a mentor to take somebody from here to here, 
If you happen to find somebody that has a starting point of here, you take them to the next level. If you find somebody at a low rung, you got to get them up a few rungs, and then everything's going to be better for it. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Um, sorry, go ahead, Jen. Go ahead. <laughs> so, Bill, the one thing that's always found interesting is that, again, going back to staying true to yourself, you've, you've managed to be very successful in your field, this new field of yours in broadcasting, but without doing a lot of the things that other people feel necessary to do, like be on Twitter and be active on social media. <laughs> and how have you managed to um, kind of stay away from that? Did you feel pressure to be more active on social media because that's the way of the world now, especially in a high-profile position that you're in? Um, I'm still going to choose to leave that one alone for a while. I don't know if I've ever been pressured. I've been encouraged. Talked to, encouraged, <laughs> and things like that. But I don't... I, I don't know. It to me, it, it's something that I don't think it necessarily concerns me. Could it benefit me if I did it? Maybe, um, but I don't think at this point in time that I'm sitting here, I feel a need to actually start that up. Um, it'd be just one more avenue for somebody to tweak my nerves, <laughs> and I think that um, I would not be the type of person that would want to handle it too easily. And then that, then you're in a no-win situation. Yep. So maybe to your original thing about know thyself, yeah. I know thyself. Well, and I, I don't tough. think I want to get yeah. in there. Yeah, I think that's tough um, to say to someone that isn't inherently just wants to be on social media, hey, you need to be on social media. Because you can tell it's not real. You can tell, you can see behind all of that if you're just forcing yourself to take a picture of you doing this and posting it. Like, it's, it's not in your makeup if you don't want to do it. It's not going to be authentic and it's not going to be good. So that's I think that's point. smart, yeah. Because I don't think everybody needs to know mm -hmm. that when I break open crustaceans at home, <laughs> how I do it. Um, I think there's a reason for it. I think that there is um, an awareness out there that is beyond what, you know, I was used to when I grew up. But for me to want to jump in that with two feet, or jump off the diving board to get into it, I just don't think that it's uh, in my bag. Hey, Ripper, uh, shifting gears a little bit to media relations. Media is a big part of what we do, obviously. And um, when you were a player, you were always really good about talking to the press, being available to the press. Um, and... Do you, I think some guys are really good about it. Some guys aren't. I dealt with both as a PR director for different teams. What are your thoughts generally now? Because the media has certainly evolved, right? Now you have a wide swath. It's not just the Baltimore Sun and a couple of TVs. Now you have bloggers and influencers and all, whole new universe. Like, what, it feels like the athletes today are under a lot more pressure and scrutiny than they were Back in the day, what's your take on the whole media landscape? Hmm. I don't know from where I said if they're under more pressure or scrutiny. I think that goes with the territory. What I've seen from the players that you used to deal with in the PR department of any individual sports team, I think more than half of these guys don't think they need somebody right. Right. like you because they can all do it on their own. And I do see a little bit of a problem with that because I see guys come up to the big leagues. I won't use any other sport. I'll just stick with mine. Yep. I see guys come up to the big leagues, and I think they have more of a desire to be a social media star than an all-star. Right. And my take on that, and maybe it's an old-school take, and maybe it's the influence in the upbringing of senior – if you become a great baseball player and you become an all-star, everything else takes care of itself. Right. But there are an awful lot of dudes coming up to the big leagues that within their first week in the big leagues and haven't done anything yet that are trying to be a social media star. And some are actually fulfilling that. Yeah. I also think the ones that fulfill it are less likely to fill, fulfill the other side of it. And that's on the baseball side. Well, I would imagine yeah. energy well, going towards that's energy away from your primary job, right? I would agree. And if you don't have parents and coaches along the way teaching you that, which in today's society, it's a lot of little Jimmy's going to be the next, you know, all-star. Say, so say Shohei. <laughs> so they he's do gonna, that. 
So you have the parents in some cases conflating the kid, right? And then you might not have a coach to say you need to work hard versus minding your Instagram. And then the whole NIL conversation comes in. So the kids that go to college are being taught now, right? You got, you can make money, you can do this. So there's a lot of factors that kids think, deal with. I think that we questioned um, maybe sometimes in major college sports, you know, what their attendance was in the classroom yeah. in years past. Yes. So now give a guy that's going to go to college that <laughs> you question that $2 million. Yeah. I'm just taking yeah. a taking yeah. a guess out there that maybe they don't go to class. It all has its benefits, but it all has its you know, downside, yeah, too. When, when you, no. like, I think, to your point, though, if you don't have someone like your dad, coach really instilling it's the game, the rest of it will come, then I think that's a challenging spot for a kid to be in, given everything around him. Hey, you're uh, watching and listening to Spin is a Four-Letter Word, the Maroon PR podcast. Jen Renahan and I um, are with Bill Ripken, a good friend, MLB Network star, former Oriole, and we're eating crabs at Jimmy's Famous Seafood. Guys, I, I'm guessing most people listening to this have been here or have seen that. If you haven't, Thanks. get down here, experience Jimmy's. It's amazing. What's going on on my right? Well, I'm just putting a little seasoning on there. What? But I dare to eat this in front of this camera over here because that's not going to be pretty once I get in there and Fred Flintstone this thing. <laughs> and for you young people, Fred Flintstone was a Stone Age character. That's right. And hilarious. Married to Wilma. Yes, based on the honeymooners. So back to the crab conversation. Was it? Wasn't it? I don't know. Um, you know, I thought it was really smart of you guys early on with the Ironbirds, minor league baseball team, to build the crab deck and make that a whole experience at the game. Um, can you talk just a little bit about kind of, you know, going into business ownership before you even got to the MLB network and, and your personality side and kind of what you I, learned I, I through all of that? Um, when I stopped playing, and um, by the way, if you want to check out, if the 1998 Detroit Tigers release you halfway through the year, you should probably just take it to the house. <laughs> um, that's what happened to me. <laughs> Um, but I remember sitting home on my deck, and it was midsummer. Um, only 33 years old, but I've been going away since I was 17 years old uh, every year. And I don't remember the last time I sat on my deck because the 17 year old didn't have a deck uh, to go sit on. And I remember sitting out there thinking, this might not be the worst thing. Um, Junior called me maybe three or four days into my deck sitting sabbatical, if you will. <laughs> and he said, um, why don't you go down to Tampa when we go down and play the Rays, uh, this weekend, we haven't talked about anything yet. Just come down there and we'll, we'll figure stuff out. And I get down to Tampa, uh, hang out with him. And by the way, going into a city, um, at like Tampa and not having to worry yeah. about go play. It's not the worst thing in the world either. <laughs> um, but I remember going in there, I sat in his hotel room and we started talking and he says, um, what do you think? We know people, we can uh, start reaching out. And I said, I'm not so sure I want to do it. And he goes, really? And we kind of mapped out, if you will, in a 